I actually want to uh, start this by saying um, we had an interesting conversation uh, in the lead up to this um, where I wasn't exactly sure whether I was going to show more recent work or this slightly older piece. Uh, it's about three years old now. Um, because to some extent, um, I could say that all of my work is very uh, intimately linked uh, to the idea of propaganda, but um, the pink detachment is the one that's probably the most um, concrete, so we opted for that as a kind of easier link, but there's so much more I could say about that. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I do want to say is also, uh, I recommend after, um, after this, uh, when you get home, uh, to watch uh, the pink, de oh, pink detachment, to watch the red detachment, it is on YouTube. Uh, and um, there really are not only um, musical sequences that I use in uh, the pink detachment uh, in the original, but there's actually a key, a key uh, piece of choreography, which I'm not going to show you, but it's actually lifted straight from the red detachment and put into the pink detachment. So for a fun little Easter egg moment, you can go and watch that when you get home and see it in context. Uh, so I'm not going to talk too much about the uh, Cultural Revolution. I'm going to uh, presume hopefully that uh, that can go without saying in this room. Um, but I do want to just very, very quickly um, synopsize the Red Detachment. Uh, yes, indeed, it was one of the model operas, one of the eight model operas. And uh, it's uh, around the story of a young kind of a uh, servant peasant girl and her trials and tribulations and um, very importantly, and this is part of um, uh, a big, uh, well, I'll get into the technical stuff in a second, but basically the story is that she has to learn how to um, become a good soldier, that she needs to rise above her personal resentments and in particular her um, an attempted uh, murder of her uh, by her former landlord master. Right? So this idea that um, one had to shed one's um, individuality and biography, autobiography, in order to forward the um, the purposes of the state was all important. Um, and to some extent we could, if, we, if this was longer form, we could talk about that indeed mm -hmm. as a kind of like one of the core seeds of what we might define as propaganda. Um, Anyway, so that's the story. Uh, so there's much training, but of course the much more important training is not the external military training, but the internal training, the kind of recalibration of a kind of uh, identity formation in relationship to the state and politics, right? Nevertheless, uh, as we were talking before it started, shorts. <laughs> it was super sexy. Um, and it's all these feminine bodies, uh, learning uh, how to shoot guns and throw grenades and all these kind of things. So, and of course, uh, quite kitschy, um, but also quite beautiful. Uh, and so, of course, that's the main question, how um, to embrace uh, an object that is beautiful to some extent, but also perhaps horrible in other, from other perspectives, and also kitschy, uh, which is a big issue, a big cultural issue. Um, so, um, short story I want to just say is this actually, uh, the Pink Detachment came actually out of a performance that I worked on in which uh, I won't talk too much about thinking, but basically I was like, Red Detachment, Red Detachment, how do I update the idea of red detachment. Um, and the first thing after much thinking and struggling uh, was a kind of linguistic slip. So this idea of going from red detachment as a kind of um, military nationalist uh, sort of formation, right? This kind of uh, red as communist uh, detachment as a military organization of women, their women, uh, to uh, meat butchery. Um, and this idea of literally taking um, animal bodies and detaching them uh, piece by piece. Uh, and that as a kind of uh, odd sort of metaphor for um, a kind of rescript of what value is in a kind of nationalist context. Um, is uh, if in the older one there was this kind of um, collective fantasy Right. Undergirded, of course, by um, 
massive social upheavals, violence was also always a kind of like underscript to all of this, which of course has a lot to do with my own family history, right? So this kind of uh, violence and then this kind of fantasy kind of overlaid atop the whole thing. Um, in any case, the national value is kind of encased in this kind of specular um, fantasy. Kind of sequence of images and dances and uh, songs that are just uh, enraptured, right? And in in fact wrapped around, right? Uh, the entire nation. So uh, that is no longer the case. It's kind of an odd one. It's still performed, still available, but it's a weird one. It's it's not current. And it stands for things that are, I would say, in many contexts a little too <coughs> uncomfortable. So uh, what I was thinking about was this idea of moving forwards then, keeping what is often said about um, China, right? That there's um, lots of different things, but amongst them there's this core confusion, particularly in the US and the West perhaps, right? It's like this untethering of capitalism from a representative de democracy. Um, and capitalism um, dictating a different kind of national value, right? So, without going too far into that, in any case, this idea of providing meat for the masses, right? Uh, we can start talking about other kinds of consumer goods, but it just seemed to make sense. And there, it retained a certain idea of uh, violence, but uh, shifted slightly. Now, um, before I start uh, getting into the film in a few minutes, I actually had a few thoughts about propaganda, which hopefully uh, will not be too, uh, what I'm about to play in the background, it won't be too distracting. <laughs> it's a little experiment on my part. This is a very important um, reference that I had, which is actually Welcome to Hormel from, I don't know, like 1962 or something. And it was this whole uh, tour of a plant um, the Hormel plant, um, which, if I'm not mistaken, uh, is part of a conglomeration that was acquired by uh, uh, Chinese uh, holdings recently, right? So there's a whole subtext that has extended into my con current work around um, meat resources, things like that. But this is sort of the beginning of this. Anyway, uh, this is Hormel. So uh, to synopsize it, meat, 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 men, 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 uh, <laughs> until. <laughs> You get to the hot dog section, which I know is so fascinating. So I'm actually going to turn off the sound, uh, and hopefully that'll work. Uh, yes, it will. Um, so I'll just play this in the background while I uh, read off just a couple thoughts about propaganda, <laughs> and we'll see how it goes. Oh God, uh, we're being taken on a tour. You know. Okay, so uh, uh, yeah, and you'll see some familiar things, but I do want you to notice the mixing of a pile of red and then a pile of white. Uh, I don't want to um, draw out that um, metaphor too much, but I think you guys get it, right? Uh, and then also lots of women, just all of a sudden <laughs> an explosion of women. Okay, so on the okay. topic of propaganda, <laughs> <laughs> full of thoughts and questions. I know it's super distracting. It's no, it's, you can't believe it. Okay, so uh, what is the propaganda object after the entity it serves has moved on? Akin to my interest in the idea of industrial work after the factories move on, aka Hormel, but also some earlier work I did around the Rust Belt. What other kind of fantasies does the propagandistic object then retain, amplify, and even eventually invent for itself in the kind of vacuum left. Uh, so, um, second thought, what is propaganda as an emotional experience from the inside? If one is embraced, we often think about propaganda or speak about propaganda from the outside. What in fact is it as an artifact from the inside? Um, and how similar is that to many other experiences that, of course, we don't call propaganda? Now, um, considering propaganda from the inside, um, I don't, this is worth a lot more thought and certainly a lot more time. But I'm reminded of two kinds, two kind of double terms. 
Uh, one of them is Du Bois's um, Double Consciousness, and on the other hand is um, Orwell's Double Think. Mm -hmm. um, and both um, center around and are kind of, I know that one should never bring those two together really, but both kind of strike me in as far as they're about this kind of um, cognitive dissonance or a lack thereof around identity formations that are um, formulated in opposition to, right? So um, when we get into a kind of, um, a uh, kind of globalized society, not to say just China, but globalized society in general, where there's very many um, seeming in, seemingly insoluble kind of contradictions. How actually do we like retain, what kind of discourses are um, necessitated in order to um, go beyond what seems like the origin point, the unrecoverable origin point that is implied by both double consciousness and double think. I hope that makes sense. Um, and I don't, I certainly don't have the answer, but in some ways this piece, uh, by hopefully kind of um, trying to bring about some kind of um, maybe lighthearted, but also not lighthearted kind of um, attempt to go beyond cognitive distance while retaining difference. I, I, there's, there's some kind of question there that I still am finding unresolvable, but is at the core of the piece. Um, and then, uh, right. Um, finally, what's at stake in reevaluating propaganda? We're both engaged in this, right? Um, no. Um, again, this might be uh, close to that question of what is propaganda from the inside. Uh, usually that term is used, uh, uh, it's tethered to untruth, um, and it's uh, usually applied from the outside. Uh, again, that kind of posits a kind of truth, uh, rightness, origin-centered position for the speaker, the kind of designator of this is propaganda or not. Um, I, I find it really important when thinking about propaganda to not disengage that from the implication of a propagandized subject. Again, that those for whom live inside the propaganda. Um, and um, how to kind of um, turn it away from uh, subjects that are fully victimized or some kind of pastiche of passivity and to perhaps think more about what um, what does a kind of participation in propaganda produce? What was it meant to produce in any case as a kind of collective fantasy? And what kinds of effects does it create that are not fantastical, in fact? Um, and a whole story I was going to tell earlier, don't have any time for that, is that I did work on Wall Street right out of college, right? and I was a tech writer and PR writer for a tech services firm. So of course, propaganda, that was my trade. Right? So I know too. Right? It's, a I know it's a different kind, but you know, it's the same. Uh, okay, so, uh, and of course, I don't want to minimize the violence that again underruns this term. Right? This is... Okay, so, uh, so those are my thoughts. Uh, I hope, did you guys get to see the ladies, or did it stop? Mm -hmm. No ladies. Oh, no way. Oh, got ladies. Yeah. Yeah. oh it got cut off. Yeah. Anyway, it's a bunch of middle-aged ladies arranging hot dogs. Yeah, oh, they were. Were. oh, you did see yeah. it. Oh, good. Oh, you did. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. All right. So, let's get going. Uh, I'll show you the cheese. Uh, small side note. Uh, the text is not mine. Um, it's a modified... Uh, a uh, series that I will, a uh, text that I will speak about in a moment. Uh, uh, three Body Problem, totally recommend it if you haven't read it. Um, David John Farmer, not anyone I would expect you to know. Uh, administrative Theory and Praxis, just a kind of uh, one of a million kind of uh, generic business theory writers. Uh, USD Code of Federal Regulations, 
Uh, Mumford, uh, Myth of the Machine, turned on his head, uh, and then a uh, uh, improvisation I did with an actress. I think the most um, pertinent thing in a lot of ways is this question of like, what does propaganda feel like from the inside? Um, because that's very much the story of this film in a lot of ways. It's the story of how these particular people who were engaged in this project at this time um, traveled through this period when that was, in essence, their job um, to produce uh, the cinema of the state, uh, except that the state kept changing and the desires of the state kept changing and the imaginary of the state that they were expected to project kept changing. So they had to find some way to reconcile the cinema that they wanted to make and the films that they wanted to make and the stories that they wanted to tell with the fictions that the state wanted to project during that time. And they make a lot of different arguments about the truths that they think they were able to tell through these films, some of which we may find in the footage and some of which we may not. Um, and I think for me, one of the most interesting ones is the last argument that um, uh, Latif Ahmadi makes about this idea of trying to create a space in the cinema for people who wanted a different kind of freedom. Uh, and I think when people watch this footage, they're always most fascinated, like people in the West who watch this footage are always the most fascinated by these parties, right? And these people drinking and dancing and the women in the makeup and the skirts and all of that. And it's like, that too is I think very much a fiction that existed, if it existed at all, in like a very narrow slice of Afghan society at that time. And so to project it in the way that these films did was very much part of trying to will it into existence, trying to will into existence a kind of secular society that didn't actually really exist in the more widespread way that these films kind of pretended that it did. Um, and to me that is one of the more revolutionary things that they were trying to do. Um, because you know, a secular, a secular culture never, never really existed in Afghanistan, even under communism. At one point, they renamed themselves the Islamic Communist Republic of Afghanistan, um, which is this amazing oxymoron. <laughs> um, so, yeah, they were always trying to thread that needle um, and failing because you can't succeed in threading that particular needle. It's impossible. Um, so I think, yeah, this question of how, how to live propaganda from the inside, how it feels from the inside, um, very much animates this film. And then the other question I think is, that is really relevant that you posed is this question of what propaganda does when the thing it was propagandizing for no longer exists, and what those kind of images um, and, uh, yeah, those images and those feelings and those kinds of uh, evocations do in the world when they're resuscitated, you know, decades after the audiences they were originally intended for, you know, have dissolved, right? Um, yeah, and that's, that's another big question of this film, is uh, what do these films mean now? What could they mean now in the world? What could these images mean now? And what do they start to mean when they're put into this kind of collision with what the filmmakers say now in the present? Um, and also with these kind of images of Afghanistan in the present day, which are threaded through the film. Um, because there are so many contradictions, not only in just what the filmmakers say, like in, it, in itself as text, but also between what they say now and what they made then, right? Um, and I think it's, it's difficult to tell from excerpts, but that's a lot of like what we try to construct in the film is this kind of film of contradictions um, and that works on these gaps between like the words and the images and between the words and the words. <laughs> um, 
and it is very much about the kind of evasions and omissions that are so much a part of storytelling about history when the history is about a civil war. Um, yeah. So that's, yeah, that's some of what I had to say about that. So yeah, let's, uh, should we open it up to questions? Do, you, do we want to, what, what do we want to do? Yeah? Yeah? yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I got one. Mm. Uh, to, to jump to the archival side, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, <clears throat> listening to the filmmakers mm -hmm. talk about all the obstacles of yes. so many different kinds yeah. that they constantly face, uh, I, I never really understood how many uh, films were actually completed mm. and were distributed. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't show that bit of the film, but it, it, they refer to it as the golden time of Afghan cinema. Yeah, so actually yeah. more films were made during this period than at any other time uh, in Afghan film history, except I guess right now when you have a kind of like, like Nollywood equivalent, like there's a, there's actually a great like, film about it called Nowhere's Wood, um, <laughs> Nowhere Wood, Nowhere Wood, something like that. Um, about, there's like a complete no budget film industry now that turns out like straight to DVD things, which are terrible, but there's hundreds of them a year. Um, so there, there's that now, which I guess is more films. But, but just to get a sense yeah. of the, the corpus of material that's, yeah. that's out there, what's, what's your <coughs> estimate of uh, mm -hmm. how many films actually reached a completion stage? Yeah, so during it varies a little bit in the different periods. So in the Khalq period, like 78, 79, there weren't that many films completed. Um, there were more, um, I mean, of course, there, at, during this period, they did weekly newsreels every week. So there's hundreds of those. Mm -hmm. Then there were propaganda shorts, um, kind of Soviet style propaganda shorts. And there's, I think over the entire period, probably like 40, 40 or 50 of mm -hmm. those. And then there's kind of more calm documentary shorts, which I'm actually not sure how many there are, there's maybe 20 mm -hmm. um, from that time. And then there's feature films, and I think from the Hulk period, there's only maybe like three or four that get completed, mm -hmm. but then from the Parchem period, which is like, um, uh, yeah, like 80 to, I guess really like full on Parchem period is like 80 to 87. Um, there's maybe, I think there's at least 10 features a year oh, that get completed, um, at least. Uh, and then from 88 to 91, which is the Najib mm -hmm. period, and we talk about this in the film as well, like there's a real relaxation of, of censorship because the Soviets withdraw. Um, so the Soviet money is gone, but the Soviet advisors are also gone. So there's actually a lot more freedom in the topics that, that um, mm -hmm filmmakers can take on. So a lot of films are started during that time and some of them get finished, but also that's when like more of the films get left unfinished because uh, there's a number of films that we're shooting in like 89, 90 that just don't get edited by 91 when the um, government gets handed over to, to, to the Mujahideen. Uh, yeah. But yeah, when my film uh, uh, starts going around festivals in the winter, it actually will be shown with a program of finished films. <laughs> um, because I do not want to leave audiences with the impression that no films were ever finished in Afghan film history. I think that would be misleading. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I was wondering how these people and these films mm -hmm. survived later in the years. Of the mm -hmm. Taliban regime where yeah. probably no film was mm -hmm. made at all. Uh, yes, it's for true. Religious, for religious reasons. Yeah. So how these people manage to mm -hmm. uh, get the material out or get yeah. it inside or how themselves were right. assassinated. Yeah, well, most of these filmmakers who are a little more connected and resourced um, left uh, during the Mujahideen period, so between like 91 and 93, because um, most of them, you know, being communists, which n none of them really admit to, but they all were, um, they had like pretty uh, active connections in different stands. Um, in, in the different stans, so like one went to Tajikistan, <coughs> one went to Uzbekistan, one went to Moscow, like one actually went to India because he had studied in Pune. Um, so he actually went and had a whole career in the Indian film industry. Um, 
and uh, yeah, but one went and worked in Tajikistan for like 10 years, one went and worked in Moscow for 10 years, um, and so on. Um, and then some of the other people I talked to, like the actors or crew who didn't have that same like level of network to draw on, they stayed. Um, and uh, like uh, Yasemin went back to like her home village in a remote area near Mazar-i Sharif and she was actually, she had to hide from the Taliban because she was quite recognizable um, and she was quite heavily persecuted during that time. Um, and um, the, uh, some of the crew that I talked to, um, the like negative cutters and so on who were very involved with actually like maintaining the the archive, the physical archive, they stayed at Afghan Films, there was a kind of skeleton crew that stayed there during the Taliban years, or maybe like six or seven people, um, just to keep, keep it together. Um, and there's a number of different stories about how they preserved the archive. There's a number of different versions of the story. So the most popular one is that the Taliban sent some, you know, boys to like burn all the films and the staff gave them all the duplicate prints. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, they like walled up the door to the archive and put a po poster of Mullah Omar on it um, so that the negatives were never found. Um, and then they hid all the other prints like underneath the steam back tables and covered them with fabric. So that's like sort of true <laughs> from what I understand, but with what was revealed to me during the interviews of this film, which I think sounds more plausible, is that there was like a person in the Taliban government who protected them. Um, so there was like one person in the Taliban government who decided he wanted to keep the films. Like he didn't think the films at Afghan films should be destroyed and he just basically misdirected all the other people who were trying to destroy them. Um, <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, so I, I think that's a real story, personally. Yeah. Yeah. The question about um, mm -hmm. what we consider uh, propaganda is that mm -hmm. is it is it always a case where you defining it like you know that there's a regime and there mm -hmm. that's a central uh, uh, production that's mm -hmm. control you know the screen the, the story is you know is, begins with the, the regime. Mm -hmm. Or because some some of these guys are saying like we were doing this film yeah. and the censor was getting involved, so yeah. is it a narrative? It was a narrative film that the government mm -hmm. tried to infuse, or they, they actually the whole story was always controlled by the government. Yeah, I mean I think it's a very blurry line in these films. So I think especially because these are unfinished, so they didn't go through the kind of final layer of censorship where someone would literally go in and physically cut out frames of film. Um, before before things went to the theater. Um, so there's, I think there are things in this footage that never would have made it past the final layer of censorship in communist Afghanistan. Um, but they definitely had to go through a script commission, like they had to, all scripts had to be approved by a government commission before they could go into production. Um, and they often were sent back to be rewritten at least like twice. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, that was extremely common at the time. I've talked to people who were on the commission. Um, so I think even if there wasn't that super explicit relationship where somebody was like giving them a plot, um, then I think, you know, often there was a kind of um, trimming or, or narrowing or a kind of redirecting sometimes of, of the original intentions of the filmmaker. But a lot of them still, I think, try to insert things into their films. Like, and Engineer Latif says at one point in the film, he says, um, uh, a director will show you one thing in his script, but then once he gets on set, he'll do whatever he wants, um, which I think is fairly true. <laughs> um, so I think he, um, he, he was at one point put under house arrest, and I think, uh, and actually I think he was arrested at least twice during this time for like stuff in his films. So, you know, they did try to, some of them did try to push the envelope with what they made, and there are others who like really sneak stuff into the background details of films. So there are like moments of realism, but they're not in the sort of foreground of the films, they're always in the background. Um, and there's like things, like for me, I feel like there's always like ways in which like the the actual violence that's happening 
uh, outside the frame sort of seeps into the frame, but it's 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 never you know the it's never in the, in the in the kind of main thing. It's always sort of uh, made symbolic in some way. Like that that dining table scene is not an actual depiction of what happened to Dawood's family, but it is so much like what happened to Dawood's family, but it's from a completely different story, you know? And then all those scenes of surveillance are from this film, which the filmmaker says was like supposed to be a kind of glorification of the intelligence service, but when you look at it now, it really looks like a critique of the intelligence service. So I have to wonder if like maybe the cinematographer was making a critique of the intelligence service while the director was making like a celebration of the intelligence service. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Like, Jen, what's your perspective on that question? Like, around propaganda and whether it's always mm. everything made by the state. Well, I mean, I, can I just insert right here? Because I think that's a very <laughs> nice place to sort of talk, mm. to talk about because yeah. I'm pairing with your Jens and, mm. and uh, Marion, one of the things is that it, it one, I mean, the stylistically are very, very different. Um, obviously, you've got a lot of different um, clips and things like that. I don't know the context as well as I know the context of sort of Chinese residences. Mm -hmm. But it's that constant flipping of whether this is whether this is funny or whether this is tragic, whether mm -hmm. this is true, whether this That's is true. fiction, whether this is ridiculous or mm -hmm. whether this is intention, you know, whether this is an accident or whether mm -hmm. this is intentional. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, when you're reading it, you're constantly going in and out of focus in mm -hmm. some ways. And I think that's, that happens in both mm -hmm. of your films in mm -hmm. some ways, um, but in, it's stylistically totally, totally differently. Mm -hmm. um, you know, yours seems so messy at some levels. <laughs> Um, whereas Jen <laughs> seems much messy, more yeah. scripted and sort of disciplined. Yeah. But then I say, you know, underlying the Chinese propaganda itself is much more scripted and disciplined. Mm -hmm. Where this seems much more free form and sort mm -hmm. of open, you know, to, to change. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, again, there's sort of two different things I'm talking about, but I thought it was a very interesting comparison. Mm -hmm. But this constant sort of like, <laughs> am I supposed to laugh or am I supposed mm -hmm. to like cry? Yeah. Um, yeah. Is. Yeah. Is go runs through both of yours. Hmm. I mean, I'm. I think that there's still a lot that I'm personally unpacking around the idea of propaganda. I think you mm -hmm. do. Yeah. Um, and amongst the many th things that I'm still thinking through, uh, is indeed things like the the laughter effect. Mm -hmm. Like that is very. Uh, linked to the kitsch yeah. in general, um, and trying to figure out the exact sources mm -hmm. um, and the exact contents of what is kitsch in this mm -hmm. context. I mean, we can talk about kind of canonical text, but I think that these examples are quite particular, mm -hmm. um, and and also the the humor, um, and I I think. I can only, I would have to think about it a lot more. I'm curious if you have any kind of um, mm -hmm. defined thoughts about the concepts, interior concepts, but I think that there's something about um, this emptied out shell um, mm -hmm. and the kind of, um, the time machine-ness mm -hmm. of these uh, artifacts mm -hmm. um, that seemingly don't have a, uh, believable bridge to today, there's something that sparks some kind of humor, uh, kind of like, uh, at worst, a kind of deeply patronizing mm -hmm. kind of approach to it. And But then on the other hand, uh, as um, something quite human um, that we actually do share, being mm -hmm. on this side of history or mm -hmm. geographies or so. Um, but yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure exactly. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, um, please. Yeah, I was also like maybe in both of your works, mm -hmm. specifically when looking at Jen, your work, uh, the notion of absent reference from Carol Adams seemed very kind of central. Mm -hmm. Where absent reference, but me is an absent reference to, to, um, to the death of the animal, mm -hmm. and like, it feels like propaganda in a way, always creating or is like this kind of absent reference where the reference. Is always already not there in a way, and when you're like when you're referring to this 
product, these items, these, these objects, yeah. that it's like the absence is duplicated in a way mm -hmm. because of the time, because of the actual uh, absence of the, even the illusion mm -hmm. of that regime or that time or that mm -hmm. social order or whatever somehow being present. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, but maybe like specifically with your work, I was interested in the notion of the body and the, you know, like I mean, Carol Adams talks about the body specifically in relationship uh -huh. to, to female body and possession. So, right. and the, so those are kind of like there. But it seemed to like for me, it seemed to somehow propose that there is a like in a way that the empire needs needs to include the body as this reduced fleshy uh, object thing. But also, like, while doing it, also to exclude it or mm -hmm. to make it invisible or make it like make it absent, like the yeah. same, like the female body or the meat or the, sure. like, the thing that's foundational to the empire, <laughs> you know, yeah. or the reproductive female body. Or sure. So, sure. I don't know, yeah, maybe. Well, I mean, I think it's really interesting, and I will speak about this for a moment from my side, but I think it's really interesting to kind of compare the models mm -hmm. of. Feminine identity, yeah, I think, absolutely. that are kind of like coming mm. through in both of our mm. works. And I think um, <coughs> it was, on the one hand, there's a, a, the stated narrative of this story, right? Mm. Which is this kind of, yeah, the surrendering of the autobiography for the, the um, ideological citizen, right? Um, the corrected citizen, right? Which. Um, is actually corrected um, geometrically, amongst other ways, right? So uh, it was, for instance, very, very important that, um, speaking of Soviet advisors, mm. right, um, that was a very particular um, uh, displays in the original. There's a very particular display of a modified Soviet um, ballet um, aesthetic. Um, and it was very important to, in this um, modification for this film, to cut out any flourishes, any traces of these kind of um, bourgeois and also aligned with feminine sort of uh, bodily traces. It all had to be this and this and this. Maybe 45 degrees is okay, right? But other than that, it's purely yeah. this. Um, and I'm not sure that this is um, exactly what you're talking about, but that that those kind of um, this this kind of alignment between um, the kind of narrative of transformation politically was uh, very much aligned with the aesthetics right? um, that you you uh, kind of transform, you revolutionize the kind of um, axes of aesthetics. And yes, of course, indeed, like you disappear the organic body at the same time for sure. This is all running in parallel. They all build on top of each other and they're all dependent upon each other. Right? But then it's really interesting to think about the kind of like an alternative, <laughs> again, with the same mm -hmm. uh, Soviet advisors, <laughs> weirdly. Um, mm -hmm. what, are, what are the differences in the needs of mm -hmm. the um, feminine body um, and how are they expressed in their articulation, right? The one on the side that I'm dealing with, yes, very regimented on your side, right? They're like really feminine and they're just like amplifying the femininity that yeah, wasn't like commonplace. Hyper feminine. Indeed. indeed. Yeah, I mean, it's not that it wasn't commonplace because of course this was already happening during the Dowd era and like there's a whole like liberal decade from 63 to 73 and then it's like even more so from 73 to 78 so you know in the cities some of some of that kind of performance of westernized femininity was already happening you know before before 78 for sure um it's just really amped up for film <laughs> like in a kind of startling way the makeup especially yeah. 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 Uh, I was working with these films in black and white for quite a while before I found them in color, and it was really shocking to me when I saw them in color for the first time. And their eyes, their yeah. eyeshadow oh was God. just. I was astounded. So it's like this makes them completely different films, actually, like really different films. Like the, the the whole yeah, everything that's happening with the makeup and the 
color schemes in the hair with the yeah. with the way women are actually being like a scene from Dallas. presented. It really actually kind of is, mm -hmm. um, but it also has it has something to do also with I think. Um, not just Western films of the time, but also like Eastern European films of the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, th I feel mm -hmm. like it's just reminding me, maybe mm -hmm. this, I don't know if this helps close up mm -hmm. this question in a way of Sharika, but mm -hmm. I think that um, it's while, while everything is always like towards the past, it's always anterior because like that kind of like spark of the relevance of the, mm -hmm. um, uh, sort of propagandistic image and the body that's contained within is already mm -hmm. always, I have to say it horribly, already always dead. Mm -hmm. um, it's always uh, also a kind of exemplary, um, <coughs> it's an exemplary ghost to be chased forever in the future. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of, that's that's the kind of interesting model of the body that's proposed within these, mm -hmm. these pieces somehow. That woman mm -hmm did exist, sort of, but she was always going to be in the future. Mm -hmm. we had to somehow, she was always already in yeah. the future, yeah. And we always had to, like, <laughs> as a viewer, you had to, like, somehow build a bridge to her, yeah. right? And yeah. somehow you're going to find her there. Yeah, yeah. Well, unfortunately, we're going to have to stop because mm -hmm. it's almost 9 o'clock already. <laughs> sure. But um, thank you so much, both of you. Thank all you right, all for coming, guys. Yeah.